Our next guest is Ed Pilkington. He's the Chief Marketing and Innovation Officer for Diageo North America. Ed oversees marketing and innovation for Diageo's full portfolio of spirits and beer across the United States and Canada. Ed brings over 25 years of experience with Diageo to his role, starting his career as an assistant country manager, managing distributors for Guinness across the Caribbean market. Welcome, Ed. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, Gary. Hey, Ed. Uh, full disclosure, I'm extremely fond of this human being, so he's probably going to get a, a fluffy uh, interview. <laughs> uh, uh, Ed, why don't you give a little context of, uh, you know, the, the, I'm not sure I knew about the Caribbean part. That excited me. So wait, you were just like, is the, how, how did you get that gig to be able to peddle liquor <laughs> in the Caribbean out the gate? Sounds like a pretty fun start to one's career. Yeah, I just, honestly, I just, I went in, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, people talk about take a stand. You know, say what you want to do. When I was looking for a job, I just wanted to sell stuff around the world. Honestly, <laughs> that was my brief. I'd, um, I'd lived as, as a student. I'd lived in Mexico. I'd lived in Spain. I'd traveled around and I just kind of wanted to, you know, get out there and sell stuff. So I managed to uh, talk myself into a gig. And the next thing I knew, I was cruising around the Caribbean selling uh, Guinness and Johnny Walker. When you talk about that from that perspective, because I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of different constituents here. I, I think, Victoria, thank you again brought a ton of value, especially for the major marketers on this call. But I'm going to zone in here, Ed, a little bit on your early journey, because I think there's a lot of people here who have no interest in ever doing anything in marketing or working in a big brand. But you're, what you just said caught me, so I'm going to spend one second on it. Do you believe because you were so passionate of seeing the world or whatever rationale you had to wanting to sell things around the world, that you were then more in tune to both listen to opportunities, but also speak up to take opportunities and thus the strategy was realized because it actually was your agenda and intent at hand. It wasn't that you got lucky, it's you were looking for it at every angle and thus it became. Yeah, I, know, I think so. I mean, I, one, I had a fascination for getting out and seeing the world. I really wanted to, I didn't want to be limited. You know, everyone can tell I'm British, but I spent whatever 20 years of my life living outside of Britain because I didn't want to be stuck on, it's a great island, but I didn't want to be stuck on that island. Uh, forever. So I want to have a fascination. And I do think there's a bit, if you want to go after something, you've got to go for it, haven't you? Um, and I think it just makes it more interesting. And I, I just wanted to get lots of different experience and just see different parts of the world and do different stuff. And I think you also realize, I mean, the, the, I think the great thing about moving around the place is that cliche of similarities and differences. Because I remember after about three and a half years, I worked in the Caribbean, I did some work in Mexico, and I thought, well, I better go back and get a job in the UK. I better work in the UK for a couple of years. And um, it was interesting, the perceptions around, oh, you, you know, you've worked in Mexico, but what would you know about working in the UK? And you realize there's huge similarities, but obviously there's certain differences. And I think, um, uh, yeah, so one, I think there's, it's just really interesting doing that. And two, to your point, I think, yeah, you, if you go after something you want to do, then you really make it happen. Uh, and I loved it. I just wanted to, so that first job was brilliant. I just had this massive opportunity to go and shape a business in the Caribbean and kind of, it was an important business, but I was kind of left alone. It was great. Sure. You know, and I was like 23. It was awesome. Good for you. Talk to me about the current landscape. Let's go very, that, that was macro. Let's go super micro. Um, you, you know, you've obviously played a role in the global nature of, your, of this company, you know, with incredible iconic brands like Johnny Walker and others. What is the challenge in this current landscape? Obviously the liquor industry affected from the fact that people can't go to bars and restaurants like we've seen in the past. Like, What's been, the, what's been the biggest challenge in this, in this COVID reality? Yeah, I mean, look, the reality is, I mean, it's, it's, it's been tough and also the industry is fortunate. So the tough thing is, and where it's not been fortunate, is clearly, as you say, I mean, bars, restaurants, which whilst they're slowly opening up, have been shut down. And, you know, the impact on the hospitality industry has been huge. And so obviously ourselves and, you know, all people across the industry, the industry has been brilliant in responding have been very much out there in terms of trying to help the, uh, help the industry, basically, and help the hospitality industry. So that's the first thing, and I can talk about that. And we've done, as you know, quite a lot in terms of really supporting bartenders in the industry. And actually, we've got some great work breaking at the moment on Crown, but I'll, I'll try not to do the, the immediate plug on that. Um, but, but what we also realise, people are drinking. I mean, look, we're, where we're fortunate is we're an industry where people have been at home, and, and even as people slowly come out, people still want to enjoy a drink, hopefully responsibly. Uh, and it's just so where they drink is changing. Um, the on-premise, again, as you probably know, Gary, is about 20% of our business. Um, so we lost 20%. At the time, they reckoned all the industry estimates were that 
we needed to pick up about 22% extra in the off-premise for the business to kind and of- for everybody, And for everybody's and watching, because, you know, obviously this is the industry often. grew up in, you know, yeah. uh, you know, on-premise, you know, bars and restaurants, or off-premise, retail, just to ground them, keep exactly. going. Yes, yeah, the old literally, where you drink off a promise. Um, yeah, so, so bars and restaurants are that shutting down. And look, the industry has well surpassed that. Um, spirits are doing, spirits is interesting. Spirits tends to do well in the crisis. So spirits tends to lead well, then it's followed by wine. And <laughs> a good, a good stiff people. drink when, you're, exactly. when your kids have been bothering you all day. That's right. Exactly. But it really is. Statistically, it's like every like 2008, 10, 2000, you look at it, spirits peak. So one, we knew all that stuff. So actually, when, the, when it first hit back in March, we said, look, first thing is we've got to regain the volume. Second thing is basically spirits will tend to do well. A bit what Victoria said, big brands will do well. People, re people return to big brands. It's safety, it's comfort. Um, so we put some principles in place, which were comfort, utility, and service. And one was comfort was all about making sure all our cons was relevant for that moment. It was kind of reassuring. It put a smile on people's face. We didn't want to do doom and gloom. Oh, my God, the world's coming to an end. Sure, stuff. You know, we're an industry at the end of the day. We want, you know, the moment you're right, when you had that, hopefully, Johnny Walker at the end of the day or bullet or whatever, it's kind of for all that we're stuck here you know, try and make the most of it and enjoy it. And we can be a part of that. And then utility was about, um, you know, how do you make it easy for people buy, to buy our brands? Again, when 20% of the business has gone. And look, Gary, I don't need to talk to you about e because you know more about it than virtually everyone on this call. But um, as you probably know, I mean, if you take spirits, only 25% of people going into COVID knew they could buy spirits online. Within a in, bright, in May, America, 25% mm -hmm. of people had. Um, yeah. So, you know, Insane. just that digital acceleration is phenomenal. Um, you know, really, um, and then the, the service piece was what are we going to do across all of our brands to help communities? And again, I thought it was interesting what Victoria said about brand love and communities and that community element of it. Um, and you know, we're, we're still how, doing how, that. So how, those kind of give me, let's paint a picture to what you know, anything you can share about supporting partners and communities, bartenders, restaurants, communities, yeah. anything, yeah, big time. So we started, I mean, if you remember, it all kicked off what 13, roughly 13 to March when I think everyone went into lockdown. 17th was St. Pat's, um, all the great right. and yes. of course we kicked off with, so we flipped from doing what was going to be massive activation in all the Irish pubs and bars and in the parades to just putting out some copy which was we'll march again and we just did that emotional you know we're, we've signed a lease for 9,000 years this is just one moment in time we'll be around for a long time and it had a huge impact and you know what we did we just got that message out and honestly kind of our business it was our keg business which is the draft business of the pints you get in the pub obviously disappeared overnight um our business in cans that you buy in an you know in a liquor store in a grocery store it just boomed um so that really helped because people actually realized they could buy guinness at home we gave a lot to bar the bartender guild uh, we've helped the restaurant association uh, and it tends to be brand by brand so don julio has really helped the restaurant association um we've done some diageo stuff and actually a really interesting thing we're doing now as we go into almost the the next phase, which is probably as people start to come out. Um, we just launched over the weekend with Crown, with Crown Royal, a program uh, which basically is giving to help kind of stages, so uh, live music and bars. Uh, and it's basically a, a song with um, Ari Lennox um, and Anthony, uh, Anthony Ramos, who you know, we worked with before. And basically cool. it's, uh, it's the old slide, the Family Stone song. Um, uh, and it's, it's basically, we've had 500,000 downloads. And basically for every download, we give a dollar to That's help nice. bars. Uh, and it's really cool. We had, and it's, it's all organic reach, actually. We had it all over the weekend, so it's been amazing. Uh, Bullet, we just launched new work on Bullet, which is all about hero in Bartos. Uh, and again, everything we do, we raise money and we give basically to bartenders to support them. Uh, because still, loads of them are working. If they're working, it's one or two days a week, basically. Um, and what's, what's so, the, you know, as, as, a, as a leading CMO, and obviously you're very focused on your business, but, you know, to be a CMO, you must pay attention at some level, what, what do you think is, you know, obviously, you know, I can stand on my soapbox in perpetuity around people underestimating these social channels to do branding, kind of the part Victoria and I touched on in the prior session. But from your perspective, what's the biggest misconception of you and your peer sets point of view? Like the current state of these great CMOs, which there's a ton, in your intuitive gut, or maybe in your own findings over the last 18 months, what are some of the missed opportunities, or in a more politically correct way, what are the things that, you know, 
you can, you can kind of see becoming a bigger part of the marketing tool belt over the next kind of two to three years based on things that have been accepted from the past that are no longer ringing to be true or things that are emerging quickly that are dictating the consideration or, or purchase of products in, in communication channels. Yeah, I, well, I think, look, Gary, you're amazing at it. I think that look, the, the, everyone's been, you know, the pace of change over the last four or five months and the, the pace of change in digital, I think all CMOs are getting their heads around because for all the, you know, you're, you know, I'd like to think we, you know, I mean, I'd say that example of crowd, that's all done through social basically. So that's, you know, we, we have broken on TV, I think yesterday, because we still need a bit of reach and we still need to put it out there. And we do that. And, you know, with NFL coming up, we'll be visible. Yep. So you've still got to do that. So you've got to balance that. But I think that acceleration um, is huge. And I think that, and, and I think everyone's grabbed, and again, you've been ahead of the game on this, but in terms of sort of the, the shift to e-commerce in industries where the perception was you couldn't do it or it's hard. And I think what we're seeing is people are finding ways around to make stuff happen. Uh, and do even you feel, do you legislation's feel? changing. Yeah, because, that's right. Because consu consumer, the, the, this whole thing is just forcing basically legislators to look and say, well, hold on a second. We've got some, in some cases, some, some examples of legislation, which is just archaic and not right and doesn't help the consumer. And suddenly we're doing stuff which is just going to make consumers' lives easier. And I think that's a big part of CMO's job is how do you make a, a consumer's life easier? How do you make it easier for them to buy stuff? How do you make it easier to see what they want to buy? How do you make it easier in our case for people to make drinks at home or to bake or to do their gardening and stuff like that? That's all the stuff, you know, as people get more hobbies, just, you know, I think there's a big piece about how do we make, you know, help around, I think it's utility. It's yeah. how do you almost help a piece around, you know, consumers make their lives easier and then put your brand at the heart of it. Do you and feel, that, people, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt you because I only have two minutes, but I want to get this yeah. question in. Do you think that COVID in a lot of ways created a scenario that sped up the knowledge of certain of marketer, certain marketers in certain behaviors back to your earlier point? Yeah, massively. I think it's forced. I mean, I think, I think pivot is a slightly overused word, but I mean, everyone's had to pivot and look differently, haven't they? I, I think it had to, because, you know, if you, in our case, if you lose 20% of your business, in some cases more, you've got to do something differently. So if you don't move quickly, you've got to. And I think it has sped up how, because, you, because the pace has changed in terms of how consumers are. Um, so if you've just got to be close to what consumers are doing, how consumers are, and then you've got to move quickly, it's simple as that. I mean, and the other one I would say is the whole thing about, I think it's a really interesting one about with all the societal change we're seeing as well and everything, the whole thing about how brands operate in an authentic way as a kind of force for good, shall we say, and how do you do it in a way which can be done, which is seen to be authentic because consumers are the, you know, they're good judges of brands. Um, so if you seem to be doing it the right way, and I think that's really accelerated as well in the last few years. Well, it's, uh, it's funny you said something, uh, parting shot. It's, uh, that was so interesting to me. Consumers are the judge. Of, like, to me, they're the, they're the judge and the jury, right? Totally. You know, you know, I think that, that, you know, they are truly the Supreme Court. We can all sit here and there's, we, have, we have an incredible executive coming up for you here now. Like, this is some real firepower. But the reality is what we do in our meeting rooms play out in real life. And the cold, harsh reality is if you look at marketing's effectiveness um, in a business context, it, it misses the mark quite a bit during especially times like this. Yeah. The, the, I would argue the, uh, the only parallel in modern history to this was when society was becoming more of a television society, not a radio society. And there was a lot of brands that lost market share because they couldn't make their scripts that with voiceovers, which crushed, they didn't understand how to make a great commercial. And I think to your point, things are moving so quickly. Having the context to make the content is a big challenge. Yeah. And it means you've got, and you've got to therefore be more nimble in terms of when you make the yeah. content. We're, we're making more than ever before. Um, yeah. We have to. Most um, consumers that are watching right now have no idea that it takes nine months, you know, sometimes for a brand to get a commercial out there between testing and strategy and, and yeah. selling it through and then shooting it and testing it. And, you know, I, I don't think people realize the lack of speed. Yeah. And, and actually, and that's the thing we've, you know, it's funny, I've just got, um, you know, I was just getting a message from, we're shooting the new Guinness work at the moment. Um, uh, and it's, you know, we produced it in, it's going to be record time for, again. Because it has to be, because we just got to start to. Because it can be. Because yeah. it can be. Thanks for being on, my yeah. friend. I wish you well. Cheers, Gary. Love to see you. Cheers. Cheers.